So good afternoon to each and every one of you. And um, I know some persons would have been waiting on um, on YouTube. I, I, I checked on YouTube and I saw some folks waiting there. And um, nevertheless, we started late, but we are in for some good fun. I am happy that I have three gentlemen here with us today who will seek to address uh, some things that, you know, that we women can never understand and we have not been understanding about men. So we have some questions here. I know for some of you in the audience, you may have your own personal questions too that uh, you were trying to seek answers for for quite a long time and they weren't answered. So we are hoping that um, that through our discussion here, discourse here today, that um, you guys can be helped. As usual, before we go further, I'm just gonna pray for you, the loving audience. And um, so let us pray. Great God and eternal Father, which art in heaven, we are so thankful for the audience in a special way. Thank you for the support that they have given to me over the past months. Uh, moreover, Lord, as they continue to grow, as they continue to learn, and may your spirit continue to dwell with them in a special way. Father God, you know who may need to listen to this broadcast more than ever. Uh, Lord, may you bring them here. May you help them to connect. Uh, but most importantly, at the end of the day, may they realize that you would have created us wonderful, wonderful, both of the sexes. So have your way, we pray, through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, great. So we are going to remember to share this broadcast. Uh, very, very important. Share this broadcast to others because I know there are many persons who would want answers to the questions that we have um, this afternoon. So before we go any further, I the guests I have, um, we have um, Dexter Green and Dexter Hills from uh, the beautiful, what do I call it? Mocha is like a, it's like a, a paradise by itself. <laughs> if we want to put it like that, what he hails from Mocker on the east bank of um, Demerara. Uh, he attends the Mocker Seventh day Adventist Church. Dexter is the president of the Gold Star um, Youth Federation. Uh, professionally, he is well gifted in many, many things. And I am so elated that we can have Dexter here on the panel for our discourse here this afternoon. Uh, welcome, Dexter. Next up, we have uh, Dylan Basil. Uh, some of you may have seen comments from him from time to time. Uh, he came on. I remember he was on the pro, um, on the program, uh, the best sex ever, and I am so happy to have here have him here again this afternoon. He is um, entering. Well, I shouldn't say enter. You almost you're second year already, a second year student at the University of the Southern Caribbean. Here he is pursuing his degree in uh, in theology. Uh, forgive me this afternoon. You may be hearing some feedback in terms of some noise. The gentlemen, they're doing some cleaning here, but uh, nevertheless, um, it will not persist for too long. So please bear with us a bit. So one of the things, so I was telling you about Dylan. Dylan has been, um, he hails from Dominica and he has been involved a whole lot in preaching and in terms of outreach ministry and all of that. And I am happy that he would have consented to be here this afternoon. Welcome, Dylan. And uh, next up, we have um, a man who doesn't like me to put Mr. in front. Uh, we have <laughs> Paul Kurt. I think I'm pronouncing it correct this time, right? Good. And um, he is originally from Guyana, but he resides here in Trinidad for quite a while, many, many, many years. He is lecturing here at the University of the Southern Caribbean and music department he sings very well and uh he was on the program before yeah dexter came on before too because all of these gentlemen uh they're not new to issues in focus he came on the program when we were looking at uh remind me paul it was a young person's oh something about compatibility oh what what, what yes, about that's what it was Something with what about love and something with compatibility. I can't remember the exact caption, but I can remember we went. Uh, Paul, you know, until now that has been recorded besides Friday when we had our prayer, prayer session. But the Dutch program that you guys were on, that was recorded the longest program ever on Issues in Focus. Because it's like the audience didn't want to finish with questions and then everybody just enjoyed the discourse. So this afternoon, we're hoping to see how much enjoyment we can get from it this afternoon. And of course, audience, remember, if you have your questions, you can put it there. So 
Welcome everyone. So we're going to get straight into it. And I want to start with the question I know Sister Deborah would have been waiting a while on YouTube. And since 1.30, she would have placed this question there. And because she would have been the first to ask the question, gentlemen, we are going to begin this afternoon's program with her questions. So I'm going to put it on the screen at this point in time. Um, while you ponder on the question, I want to say welcome to um, all of our viewers, of course. Uh, um, remember, the only how I can personally know you viewing is if you put a comment in the comment section. But welcome to Ashiba, Victoria's Batson. So, great. So the first question that we have, we have up, um, ladies, and today is our day. This is the men are addressing our questions. Next Wednesday, you will hear the women address the questions that the men will have. So Sister Deborah says, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to know why is it that after marriage, some men cease to wish for sweet, well, sweet thing should be in their wife's ears. I have I had two other married men scheduled for today, but unfortunately, they had emergency at the last minute. They couldn't be here. I know the gentleman um, may not be able to. The two gentlemen that we have, two gentlemen that we have, may not be able to effectively answer this particular question. But Paul, I am going to put this question right into your um, into your hand. I don't know, gentlemen. Maybe you can make the application to relationships after being in a, a long while in relationship. You know, when you start, you used to do certain things, but eventually it started fading. Not you can make that application. Well. It is a complicated but very simple answer to the question. Um, we are all creatures of habit. And what ends up happening is that with re regularity, uh, we begin to become a little bit forgetful. That's really what it is. Um, you know, anytime something becomes consistent we tend to go on autopilot right it happens with regularity you know and then eventually we stop paying attention so that's a very simple answer but then it becomes a little bit complicated and this is from experience i mean i had both a long courtship and so far a longish marriage in that I, I courted my wife for eight years before we got married. And we've been married for the last 13 years. So we've known each other a very long time. Uh, and I noticed myself, and I'm conscious about it, not saying the sweet nothings uh, or the sweet things often enough. And the answer is simple. Well, well, I said the simple part. The complicated part is this, that quite often, when the business of life begins to crowd out both persons, not just the man, uh, we tend to become absent-minded. Because I could say for a fact that um, we have three children, and when the wife becomes busy, and my wife is busy about her children and she's serious about mothering, in other words, uh, the father sometimes becomes the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> to the woman, if you only uh, um, give her the impression that you know you're not uh, giving the children enough attention, or you're a little bit too severe, right? Or she thinks that you're not as as gentle as you should be, then she takes offense to that. But the point is that when the woman becomes engrossed in taking care of the children, especially like now where school is virtual. They're home all the time. Yeah. She's into taking care of their every need and wish. What ends up happening is that sometimes the husband gets to hold second place. Now, I don't resent it, and I don't hold it against her, because a woman's first uh, commitment is to her children. That's nature. God made it so. It's biological. Mm -hmm. So that what happens is that once she becomes busy about her children, she too becomes so into managing the home, managing the children, 
dealing with the homework, the schoolwork, and things like that. That she herself uh, does not give you the kind of attention that you crave. And it's not intentional, it's circumstantial, right? And so what ends up happening is you get less attention. Um, sometimes when you try to buzz around her uh, and bother her a little bit, she says, man, you know, I've got something to do. Don't disturb me now, you know. And so you feel a little bit rejected sometimes. Or when you try to go about her, about the sweet nothings, or about the thing that happens after the sweet nothings, uh, sometimes, she, you know, she thinks you're being un a little unreasonable. She'd say, oh, gosh, man, you seeking attention and you don't realize it's not about you. Uh, you know, we have children to take care of and, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So like that, the man tends to back off a little bit. And in backing off, he backs off the amount of sweet nothings and the amount of attention that he used to give. Uh, not because he is angry, but in trying to be understanding. And so what ends up happening is yeah. that you begin to drift a little bit away from each other. Mm -hmm. right? So that is the, that, that is, there's a simple answer that over time, uh, it becomes so regular that, um, it, you know, it stop happening, stops happening as frequently. And then also sometimes there's the push factor of just life. And yeah. it's, it's on both ends. It's not just that the man moves away, but sometimes the woman's attention uh, turns to a different focus. And so the man learns to kind of leave the woman alone a little bit. So sometimes she is partially responsible for it. Hmm. All right. So Sister, Sister McKinnon, if you're listening, um, I hope that this answer was understandable. And to all the ladies who, who have joined us, I want to say welcome to all of you. And um, John, of course. You're there. And for the gentlemen in the chat or those of you who are viewing, if by chance for any of the questions you have, you can pl place your comments in the comment section. Or if you don't want to put your comment in the... Yes. So what you can do is you can... Uh, you can join the chat and uh, you will be allowed to um to give your comments so gentlemen the two of you i don't know if you had experience being in a very lo a long distance relationship and perhaps your girlfriend or 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 um well none of you are not marius yet but your girlfriend would have said to you, why is it that you're not telling me the things that you used to tell me before have you both experienced that and if so what is your justification for it Well, as I think about the question, good afternoon, everyone. I just um, I just question the intention of the, the gentleman in the question, the, the, the husband, that is, and as to what was his intention when he was whispering these sweet things in her ear? Is it because he wanted to get her? I'm thinking that maybe the strategies that men use to, to get women when they become married, then they'll probably use a different strategy to keep them. So, you know, think of it like a like a fire. You know, when you start the fire, you, you sort of put in the wood and everything. But when it's fully blazing up and blazing, you don't necessarily have to put in any more wood per se because it's already blazing. So I'm just thinking that probably when the relationship is at the mature stage, in that you're now married, that you know the this you know, whispering little sweet thing, you're gonna think about, you know, that's probably for, you know, young people or, or when you're trying to get the person. But now that you, you're with the person, yes, you put your attention on bigger things like, no, I have to get her a house, you know, I have to take care of her, I have to be a form of security, I have to, you know, give her children, I have to support her. So, you know, your, your, your mind, your responsibilities now shift to greater things. So, you know, I mean, you can still whisper in her ears now and then, but <laughs> you have greater responsibilities now. So you, you sort of um, turn your attention to these greater things because you feel that, you know, this is what you want now. These greater responsibilities, the house and this, and the whispering is what you wanted initially when you were trying to sort of get it. So that's just my submission. Okay. All right. Dexter, you have anything to add to that, bro? Yes. Um, I, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. I think uh, Brother Delon said it very well. 
that um, sometimes I believe it's a strategy we use to actually get closer to a young lady. But then sometimes we become so comfortable um, mm. that, you know, we, we got this girl already. And like he said, we started to focus on other things now. Now, now how, try, how to try to try how to keep her and, and all of these other things, right? And so I, I just believe it's a strategy. And sometimes, sometimes too, when you look at how the female react to when you compliment her and tell her nice things too, sometimes that can be a motive of why the young man not really saying anything more to her because she's not very receptive to the to the comments that is being give, given to her and so um all of that can be factors of why sometimes the guy you know do not um continue to do, do these things or say these things because in his mind especially if he doesn't come out and say well listen you know i'm not accustomed to those things because there are persons who are not accustomed to those things yeah and um maybe they came out of an abusive relationship that they they wasn't getting it. And so when they get it now, they might feel as though that, you know, we're trying to lure them into another um, tragic relationship and whatever. So I think it's basically how the woman responds as well, especially to, to the compliments that she's been given. All right. Thank you very much. I just want to encourage the audience to share this broadcast to your pages, to your Facebook pages. Uh, but if you're viewing, for those of you who are viewing on YouTube at this point in time, you can send a link. Um, to your friends, but I just want to bring up a comment. Um, Jane, I'm going to start us. Uh, I want to bring up Jane. Jane's comment. She she made me laugh, but I saw it. She said, um, when you're born again, do you stop praying, etc.? No. <laughs> right? And um, I know sometimes all the, the comments that the men gave, they're very profound, and I can see um, on each aspect of it. Ladies, I know it's your, it's your time to vent your feelings and vent everything in the chat. If you, uh, I mean, listening to them, I could, I could really understand where they're coming from. But if you don't, you know, put your, put, 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 come on, just put your comments there. Let us see. Maybe we can try to establish. So the end of this broadcast, at least, uh, we will be able to better understand the, um, the males. And the other question is this: I know, oftentimes, ladies always find it difficult to understand this. Is why is it that men are afraid to, um to show, to not show their emotions in situations? Why is it that men are afraid to not show their emotions, their true emotions in uh, situations? Um, if I may go, I think I think it has to do with how the, the, the man was brought up. Okay. And the, and, the com and the company that, you know, he had or his friends that, or his influence. Um, you know, we were taught to be tough. And and you would hear persons saying, you know, if something happens to me and I started to cry, you know, you, why are you crying? You always crying like a little girl and these kind of things. And so we try to prove to people that, listen, I, I'm tough, you know, but I, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm very emotional, but tough at the same time. And I think <laughs> because the way we brought up, we were brought up and the friends that we normally keep that sometimes pressure us into not trying to show that emotion. Because, of course, we are born with, with it. Um, it's something that God placed on, on in each and every one of us. Of course, women have more than men. Uh, but I think it's the way we were brought up. We, we were taught to be tough, to be rough, and we shouldn't show that side of, of us, right? And, and sometimes, too, men do it as a support to women, too. Because if you if, if something happens in the house with you and and the women crying and you crying, who is competing who? And so sometimes we do it to to really show that listen, we are there for you and you know yeah, we are the we are the shoulder that you can lean on. Even though sometimes we, we do need that shoulder to lean on to cry to. But um it's it's just how we were brought up for me. Socialization. All right, thank you for your response. Mm-hmm. Well, but I would say that um, in life, we sort of equate certain emotion to certain circumstances. So generally, when we think of a funeral, you know, we think that we should cry. 
or when we haven't seen someone for a long time of our, of our loved ones, we think that you know we should be we should show some form of jubilation, you know, because we would have seen that that person. But I always think of the fact that um, what if what if men lack of emotion? What if our lack of emotion or our not showing emotion is actually our true emotion? Is that just the emotion of men? Is that our true emotion as men? You know that the lack of emotion, not showing emotion, not crying being strong well, but um and sometimes you know we also equate them um, certain emotions to certain gender so we say that you know crying is a woman thing so as a man you know you don't want to do that you don't want to show that you're weak you don't want to show that you're crying because you think that you know that's that's a woman thing you know so because of pride you know we are a bit fearful as men to be associated with certain emotions in certain circumstances it's all down to you know a little bit of pride as men Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if I should have. Um, now, um, we come from a patriarchal yeah. culture. Okay. Um, we also come, well, Africans are not patriarchal, actually. They're matriarchal. But Christianity is what I'm referring to. We come from a patri patriarchal culture where especially the Old Testament God mm -hmm. is a tough guy, <laughs> right? And God is masculine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And because as Christians we identify with a masculine God who is usually a God of justice and judgment. It's not until the New Testament God that we see the merciful sign. Right, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then Jesus also said that all the commandments that we have boil down to two, love, right? Love for God and love for your neighbor. And again, all of it is just love, right? So uh, we come from a patriarchal religious superstructure and we live in it today also because those who, especially as Seventh-day Adventists would know, that while a woman can study theology, quite often it's difficult for her to become uh, uh, accepted and placed as a pastor, right? So we have to look at that, at, at the power structure, okay? Um, which is set up and completely masculine. And mm -hmm. therefore we have this impression that uh, Part of being male is being impenetrable, and it, it 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 goes over also to our emotions. Now, I think just like uh, the other two panelists, I have to agree it's conditioning, right? And it's the same reason why I never was able to explain until very very late. Uh, the disposition of one of my mentors. And she said that the problem is that while people complain about the way men behave, they don't raise their sons any differently, <laughs> right? So the women will complain about the faults in men. But you watch, when they have a son, they don't try to teach him differently. They bring him up uh, to fit into the mold that society has made and expects, which is it also contributes to why the man continues to be afraid. Because the women who condition them or raise them, raise them the same way. They, weigh in, they raise them to be the way they complain about, right? <laughs> so that, 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 because mothers also join in the chorus of, we're crying for, there's a little girl, you know, that kind of thing, right? Now, and again, going back to the maternal conditioning. Women who have children will nurture the girls and teach them how to be because they believe that they are weak and soft. And because they're weak and soft, they need to be protected and nurtured. And they take their boys and they loose them wild. Because they're tough, they're boys. They're going to get along and they're going to make it somehow. 
And this is why we have so many messed up men in the world today who not just have a lack of ability to show empathy and emotion, they end up being so emotionally unintelligent that they end up being uncaring and in some cases abusive. And it's because they have never been shown tenderness, gentleness, and love because somehow their mothers felt they didn't need it because they're boys. That's not part of, of raising a boy. And so the boy is left to fend for himself. And so some of the toughness that he develops and the lack of show of emotion was just a coping mechanism for his own survival because he got no nurturing and no loving and no tenderness, right? And because of that, uh, men end up quite often being messed up and it manifests itself in the symptoms that women see, like the man don't show no emotion, right? Um, because their mothers felt that they didn't need any, so they basically left them on their own. Yeah, valid, valid, valid contribution comes back to socialization. And you know, I was, it was during this week, I was looking at the spoken word. Um, I think it was captioned why men are not to be blamed for not crying or something of start. And you know, they were, they were exploring the fact that, you know, we are, uh, we are grown, we not to speak, not to, um, not, not to speak wrong. And as I paid attention to, um, to the poet, I felt that so deep within because indeed there's several men um, out there who, I mean, sometimes we women take it very, very hard to, to truly understand. Um, my father, I remember asking him once, I said, dad, I've never seen you cry. Um, have you ever cried? And he said to me, um, he said, as a man, I cried twice. I cried when my yeah, my internet is extremely unstable. Yeah, so he said, uh, my father said he cried twice uh, when his sister died, and um, when was the other time? Oh, when I think when his father died. And um, when we had a family, the Vivas family would have lost six relatives one time. And he was the person going back and forth to the, um, to the mortuary. And he said he cried then. And I mean, I couldn't really understand it. I grew up seeing my brothers crying, but I mean, now they're men. I don't really see them, them crying like that. But as, um, you know, Pastor Manzano makes a point. Welcome, Pastor, by the way. He made a point here when he said um, tears are often associated with an experience where the individual, how a male wants to portray himself, neither is it the truth that a woman is comfortable with. Men are usually portrayed as embodying strength. Yeah, powerful submission there. Um, and it carries me to, when I, when I look at that now, the, the second question I want to ask you, um, the other question rather, I want to ask you gentlemen, um, in terms of, so we move from socialize, the socialization aspect of it, men not showing emotions, to this aspect um, of why, why are men less forgiven in cases of infidelity? I want the audience to know that these questions were created by ladies. I couldn't come up with questions for this topic, really. And ladies would have sent um, send these topic these questions to me so i want to hear your your response on that i am just so when i when i think about the other panelists i was i would have been so eager to hear what they have to say in these particular topics but unfortunately they couldn't be here for those of you who now join um yeah we had we were supposed to have about two other married person and one other single person on the panel but unfortunately emergencies do happen so over to you gentlemen let's have some straight talk sister grace yeah straight talk
And this is where I know they- I, I thought they you were going to invite who goes <laughs> first or second or what. Oh, so you're not moderating. <laughs> no, I want to allow you to really and truly um, speak from your anybody in any random order, unless I see the need to call on you guys. Okay. Um, it's really, really uh, very simple, right? Um, the fact is that um, human, the, the attitudes toward human sexuality has evolved over a long time, okay? Um, in the ancient world, um, human sexuality was very, very fluid. Um, you know, you go way back to uh, pagan times and in pagan cultures, uh, you'd find that uh, female liberation was a whole lot more widespread because, of course, of, of paganism's idea that the feminine is what is most powerful and important uh, for very simple reasons, right? Uh, the female, uh, they believed, is what gives life. Hence, you know, Mother Earth, you know, is what is spoken of because we know that the Earth grows our food, gives life, blah, blah, blah. So they felt that you know, the female being the person who bears the child um, was extraordinary, et cetera, et cetera. And so like that, in, in, in ancient times, you know, the, the, there's the idea that all these you know, the oracles in ancient times were somehow um, sexless which is not the case. Um, re recent research would have shown that what had happened is not that they were not, uh, it's not that they were sexless, it's just that they weren't committed to a husband or belonged to anyone, but they used to entertain um, sexual guests, okay? Which of course is a lifestyle, lifestyle that as Christians we don't subscribe to, but that's the way they used to do it. So women were free to, uh, exercise themselves sexually without judgment, right? In those days. Now, we fast forward to the Christian era uh, where the Roman Catholic Church basically um, demonized uh, sex, uh, hence their practice of celibacy, right? To be more like Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and then of course everything became male-centered, right? All the priests are male, blah 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 blah. So then the rise of of importance of the male and his sexuality, etc. Now that's just to give the background to answer the question. Now um, the church came to view sexual sins as among the most serious. And they call them presumptuous sins. Now, the fact is that we have evolved into beings that have become very male-centered, that the society has. And I believe that it's selfishness uh, that causes selfishness in the way society is constructed based on, on it being so male-oriented, that we have come to become less forgiving of female infidelity and more forgiving of male infidelity. Because I grew up hearing in my family, which was a very traditional family because we have Barbie suits, right? Uh, was fame for man is shame for a woman, is what the matriarch of our family used to say, right? Was yeah. fame for a man is shame for a woman, right? And that came directly out of slavery. Now, because there were stud farms, and of course, the more the slaves produced children, uh, meant more, um, more property, more bodies for the slave master. So that um, the male slave was encouraged, basically, 
to go about to all the different barracks or huts and impregnate as many women as he could. And he had no responsibility for those uh, children because Massa would mind them, the Massa's property. So that the male learned out of practice over several centuries to go about sowing his royal oats. And it was something that A, he was not responsible for because he didn't have to take care of the progeny that came forth from it. Hence, you know, it's a Caribbean problem that men make a lot of children and don't mind them, right? That's one. And two, once you uh, are able to give Massa all these children, you become a stud, right? Worshipped and glorified. So it became uh, the thing that made you famous. Now, so, and, and the remnants of that remains in our society, that it is unspoken, right? That if a man does it, it's less bad. If a woman does it, it's more bad, right? So that we, we have developed a selfish mm -hmm. way because we have been conditioned, right? So that, um, so that, uh, that we have learned to, to glorify it as males. Now, because that coming down to our society uh, has been distilled, it, uh, coming down to our society, we have viewed it especially non-Christian men, as a sense of entitlement because you're a man. It's one of them things that you might prob more be, ha probably have a propensity to doing. Okay? Mm -hmm. And society has learned to sort of look the other way when a, when a man does it. Whereas when a, when a woman does it, uh, you know, it, it is seen as more terrible because society tends to uh, view it that way. And we have accepted and adopted that outlook, many of us, without even thinking about it, which is why we tend to become less forgiving. The other thing is that we, in our Christian construct, are taught that a woman gives herself to her husband. We sort of forget that the Bible does say that we leave our mother and father and cleave to the wife. Even though it comes out in the ceremony, we hold less to that and we hold more to the societal norm that the woman gives herself to her husband, okay? And because the woman is seen as the man's property, and it is even continued by society, the woman takes the man's last name, right? The, the man never takes the woman's last name. So the woman sort of gives up herself, her identity, and sort of belongs to her husband. And then, of course, our Bible teaches us that the man is the head of the home, the man is the head of the family, which again harkens back to Catholicism, right? Uh, where, where masculinity became the thing, right? Um, and because of all that conditioning, um, when the woman cheats, it feels worse because she's somehow belonging to and the property of her husband. So much so that we see it in Guyanese society or in society in general where um, women deal well with penis loss because if the man leaves her or is unfaithful to her, she just gets another man and she moves on. But if the woman is unfaithful to the man or leaves the man to go to another man, he thinks that he has got to beat her or kill her or both, right? Um... Be, uh, so it, it's it's all of that 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 it's the, it's the idea that somehow women are yeah. the property of men, and if she does uh, something like that, it's worse, right? And it's 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 just a terrible thing that is very old. All right, um, I want I want to I want to talk it real, right? Um. I, it has to do, of course, with a man's ego, of course. And I want to go to the streets a bit, being out on the road and all of these things, right? And again, I'm, I'm bringing up your influence and your friends and whatever. Now, for me, how I see it, that women are full of love and full of affection. Plenty, they, 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 are, they, they are full of that. And because they are full of that, they 
extend those affections and love to us as men. And uh, we get it in full so much that when we come up with the thought of another man having all of those attention and having all of those niceness and those love that we know that we should be getting because as as plain as it is as man in our at, at least in my mind if a woman cheats she has feeling for this man a woman don't don't just pick herself up and go out there and just say listen i want to have sex with a young man she has to have feelings for this guy and so all of that is playing in our mind now also we look at the part of respect because if i as a man now with again with my ego and my pride take this woman back now my friends now especially with a guy she slept with that i know they're saying watch your teeth i sleep with the girl and he still takes she back remember his yeah. joke remember his this. i want to be real right so we find it hard to do that because listen we want to we want to maintain our respect also we want to maintain our our dignity and everything and keep our egos intact so i believe it's hard for men because we know the kind of love that our spouse or girlfriend or whoever gives to us and to know that another man is experiencing that it is very hard for us to forgive that young lady for that for that because she she she's emotionally inclined she has some form of feelings for this guy and you start to question yourself now am i good enough do i make enough money do i have a house do i have a car you're studying now what is it that this man have that she, that you don't have that she has to be going to him and so i think that's a main reason of why we find it hard to forgive i i feel that paul if you listen to dexter right it's yes. like I, I i don't know if he had any experience or whatever with it but it sounds so deep rooted in his heart boy I no but he made sorry, yeah, all submissions. yeah no he made he made a very 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 valid and very powerful point uh, i mean i couldn't stop nodding all the time it was yeah. just fantastic the thing i would like to say though is you mentioned a very important point which also ties in with what i just mentioned it's societal pressure and why society pressures because again they have been accustomed to and conditioned by these unwritten social codes that like i said has come down from a long 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 time when you had all this shift about the attitude toward um the role of women and men in sexual relations right and and that's what it is yes he's he's worried about what people going to say because he looks like a fool if he takes this woman back and that kind of thing and and again like i said it's society uh that is pressuring him um so this is is the unwritten societal pressure and what does that come from again our patriarchal culture uh, culture and patriarchal stance with regard to how we treat fidelity and infidelity between uh, a man and a woman sorry i i missed some of the points because my internet i i already guys gentlemen please be prepared we will definitely have to get a part two for this program right because i'm looking at the questions that i have and ladies if you're in the chat call them you can you can still send your questions we are going to um i hope that all of you can make it back to next week but then in addition to that are we going to see how much we can expect to be at the next week um it's now 301 301 yeah so the other uh so we are still on this um this question here but before um sister Geraldine would have mentioned this dexter but when y'all yeah, let's do it is okay yeah i like knock and knock back you know this this, this is a saying in guyana right if you take him you want you you, you like knock but you're like we can't take uh, not, not work harder than that. <laughs> yes, Sister, Sister Raylene, I love you, but today we're talking neck about back. women. We can talk about women next. Neck back. All right, we let me hear what we don't have to say on this topic, on this question here. <laughs> I think, um, I think um, <laughs> All right, Delon. Yeah. 
I'm saying I think Dexter would have summed it up well. And then just to build on, okay. on what, um, on what um, Thomas was already said, when I think of um, you know, what Paul Court would have said when he gave you know, the history of, you know, and we look at the biases in society as it relates to men and women and the sexuality and how we think that you know, when men do it, it's all right, and if a woman do it, it's not so all right. But um, you know, when I think of it, I think of the fact that, you know, generally men, you know, they have a pride and an ego to protect. I don't know where they get that from, but they always feel that they have a pride and an ego to protect. You don't know where they get that from, Dylan? <laughs> Do you have pride and ego, Dylan? I'll be very then, happy for you. You're a different man if you don't have pride and ego. Woo, kudos. So, so, um, so it doesn't matter. You know, sometimes men have, you know, two, three, you know, women think they, they are right when they have two, three women, but when a woman has two, three men, it's not all right. So, you know, when I think about it, it's not, it doesn't really matter how much women a man, a man have, whether he have two, three, four, but there's always one that can sort of shatter his world and bring him down. All right. So if the others you know, find themselves in infidelity, you're going to trouble him so much. But that one that he loves, hmm. when he does it, it shatters his world, you know? Because um, to, to a man, being faithful is the greatest test of love and respect a woman can show to him. So when that is violated, his entire world is shattered, especially if it's from that girl that he, he loves. Because there must be one he loves, all right? <laughs> And you know, when he walks in the street, yeah. as Dex would have said, you know, they're teasing him, you know, so he's talking about you, you're feeling like you, you, you lose points, you feel that you lose your masculinity, you know, when that happens to you. <laughs> so so it's, it's very difficult to come and sort of bring up that forgiveness and take that woman back, knowing that he has to live with that, I call the call, that, that, that thorn in his flesh for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I, if I may say, right, um, I mean, the male sense of entitlement also, you know, you know, it, it's all right when he does it and it's bad when the woman does it. The male sense of entitlement also comes from something that is purely biological. Okay. When you look at the fact that the woman is always seemingly, I notice I say seemingly. Yeah. Seemingly in the disadvantageous position by sheer biology. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we know, of course, later when we become wiser as we get older, that uh, the woman is in more of an advantageous per, uh, position in the long run. Because eh? uh, uh, for all the sacrifices they make, their children do value and love and elevate them and put them on a pedestal much more quickly than they would their fathers because, of course, wisdom would teach them uh, about the, the meaningful role that the woman has played. But yeah. uh, in, our, in, 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 the current, in the current circumstances and at the stage of development and life in which we find ourselves, when we look at the sheer biology of the disadvantage that the woman suffers is what makes us uh, develop this arrogance and this sense of entitlement. You think about it, one, about the way that society treats women. Um, we are saying, Guyana, uh, when I lose my bull, you tie your heifer, right? So we let the boys go anywhere and everywhere uh, without um, protecting them as much because we feel that they can't be penetrated, right? Uh, whereas you keep the girl at home. And I know this for a fact. You know, I could get to go all kinds of places. And when my sister asks, no, you're a girl child. you got to stay home, right? That kind of thing. That's the very mm -hmm. first thing. So the woman suffers because she could be penetrated, or at least in normal society. And uh, that's one. Number two, we think about the, the sheer trauma and pain that the woman must endure uh, at being opened up by a man when she loses her virginity, right? It's the woman who suffers, okay? She bleeds, she feels pain, and she suffers the trauma, too. Uh, three, 
The woman gets pregnant, the man doesn't. And she's the one who has all the trouble of pregnancy, whether it's vomiting, losing her teeth, having sleepless nights, having to breastfeed the child and deal with sore, bleeding nipples or whatever. Or she has to breastfeed during the night and go to work the next day and all that kind of thing, right? So the woman is the one who is tired, uh, making all the sacrifices. So because of that, instead of looking at the fact that the woman probably does a lot more or suffers a whole lot more and endures a lot, a lot more than we do, to just really uh, sustain society and life, we see it the other way around. You know, we powerful because we men, we don't have to go through all that. You know, <laughs> whereas the woman is always the one bearing the cross. <laughs> and it's society and biology that does that to them. And because of that, we tend to feel like the woman doesn't have a right. Therefore, if she crosses the line, we are less forgiving because she is weak and seems to be con condemned by nature and society to being disadvantaged. And so she must know her place, which is why when she's unfaithful, we want to slap her down because she's the, the, the weak, suffering one and she shouldn't dare, right? So that's why also we, we don't tend to accept infidelity. So in the meantime, uh, I'm just going to put uh, up Pastor Manzano's comment from here. From the woman. Mm -hmm. um, when he said, um, all right, good. So Paul, you want, Paul, finish off your point and then I'm going to put it up. Right, right. Because, I mean, I, I grew up with old men around the place who used to say things that were really callous, right? Because um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in my family, um, a few uh, old guys would come around because uh, my grandfather happened to be in the city. So, you know, his old relatives, whenever they traveled to the city, would always stay by us and you, you hear the old talk, right? And, you know, one of them had said something, which, of course, at the time I couldn't understand. I was nine years old. But um, he felt, he said, man, look, a man more, um, got, got more right than woman, man more powerful than woman because, you know, a woman has got to lie down first and get up last. I was like what? I was nine. Mm -hmm. Right? What does it mean that the woman got to lie down first and get up last? <laughs> you know, in other words, they feel like nature uh, has has empowered the man. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he can afford to be uh um he has a right to be wrong then. He has a right to be wrong. Wow. Thank you for the submissions, gentlemen. And um, so this 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 comment here, I uh, he said that infidelity in the experience of sex is received differently. A man estimates his friends with his ability to see he will always wonder if the other man is better in bed. Yes, like the point that Dexter was making. <clears throat> wonder what is it that is, why does this, this woman got to be emotionally connected? I know one thing, gentlemen, I mean, some women cheat for different reasons, but um, generally speaking, it has to be, I mean, some women may just do it because they need finances or whatever, but most times it's some emotional connection, Dexter, indeed. Most times, there's some emotional um, connection. And then he makes this other point. In sex, the male gives and the woman receives. No matter how it is done, he penetrates, ejaculates. She is the receiver. Nevertheless, still doesn't justify. Justify men. Justify. What I understand, I usually have chats with men. So when it comes to those things and the less forgiven and all of those things, yeah, I, I, I tend to understand it because, of course, how society would have brought, um, how men are brought up in society. And um, mentally, the woman relates to that act differently. She looks at it from uh, soul and love. He focuses on the, on solely love. Yeah, she focuses, focuses on the sex act. And uh, that carries me to my next point, gentlemen.
And I want to know uh, why is it that some men find it extremely difficult to control their sexual urges? Because, you know, women, we have this thing where men just go sexing around the place, uh, woman to woman, and it's like, you know, nothing. So we want to know as ladies, why is it that some men find it extremely difficult to control their sexual urges? We didn't want to generalize the same all men, right? So let's see if you guys can help us to, um, to answer and to clear up the information that we have, our perception that we have um, concerning this particular topic. Question, madam. Dex, you like to start? Um, no, I have to come out from the streets and I have to, I have to now go, I have to put on my Christian cap now. Um, hmm. I believe sin would have done something to this world and more so done something to human beings, right? Um, now, sex is something that God created for a man and a woman, married, of course. And sin would have mixed that up so much that there's no temptation and, and, and men not seeing women as potential wives to, to get married and then want to, 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 to do this act. But we are seeing women now more than one women sexually attractive i think that's that's also how we was built uh, because remember when adam looked at eve adam said this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh they were just a natural sexual connection when adam saw eve and so adam is our four parents so it that that same trend was passed down when we look at a woman, all we see is the bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. It does not justify why we must want to be out of control when it comes to our um, sexual desires. But it is it is it is something that is instilled within us, and especially when we see, we want. That's how we were built. What we see, we want. It doesn't mean that we'll get it or we should go after all of it, but what we see we want i think we were just built that way and um, but but sin would have messed it up in a way that we see all of the women in one particular way and we want all of it too as well the temptation is there that yeah you could get this from this one and you could get that from that one and you could get this from this one and so i i i, I blame sin right but we still could control it with the help of god we still still could control it with the help of god but because of sin I think things got a little bit more messed up and how we see the, our, our women today as just sexual um, uh, persons, we tend to like sometimes lose our way because of what we see, right? But I just, I just believe it's how we were built and I just believe we can control it with the help of God, but it is not something that all men can control because not all of us, you know, are in the light. Hmm. Yeah, I understand. Dylan? Yes, well, I like what he said in that it is a natural urge. So it, it, is, it is embedded in all of us men. So I'm trying to think, like, when is it out of control? When you start going all around the place with all the different women? Because quite naturally, if it is natural, then it will be active from time to time. So I'm thinking that... Um, Having the urge, you know, being act, having it active from time to time, you know, feel having feelings and you know things in your mind, is it all is it out of control then, or is it out of control when you start actually falling? You understand? Because um, you know, psychology and all these things will tell us that um, you know, these thoughts they occupy a large section of a man's mind. So yeah. as a man thinking that really and truly, you can't really get these urges away. All right, and you know there are various cultures that we grew up in. You know, certain cultures they are very strict when it comes to these things. You can't play around. There are other cultures. You know, you you match or you big when you with all these different women. All right. So I'm thinking that um, you know, and men are easily turned on by sight because you know when David would have been on his balcony and he just saw Bathsheba, 
site. <laughs> you know, Indian ladies, because these ladies are, are natural, you know, they're just, you know, sort of salt of control and he could more control than he end up, you know, falling to, to, to Bathsheba. So I'm thinking that um, instead of saying that, you know, like these urges are sort of out of control, I'm thinking, seeing that they are naturally there and we may not be able to fully control them, then we have to make conscious efforts to the things that cause them to be active to minimize them, all right? If you're married, you understand? And, you know, just seeing certain things causes you to be active and it will cause you to, you know, you're get out of control, then you sort of minimize these things, all right? But because as men, you know, they fail to put things in place to sort of minimize the urge becoming active, we just leave it to become active and free. And then quite naturally, we as men, we come out to be, find it difficult to control these urges. So that's just my submission on that. Hmm. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, the other two panelists said the obvious. It's something na natural, biological, right? And the thing I'll say is because we know it's biological, as Christians, in order to, to combat and defeat this, uh, the first thing that a man has got to do is learn to put up mm. guardrails <laughs> to protect yourself. I agree. <laughs> right? Um, because, uh, you know, sometimes it's not very easy. Because there's a pastor I met, was it at graduation last year? Um, I think so. Who had told me, uh, I mean, this is a little bit on, off on a tangent, but I'm just following on on what somebody else had said, right? He said, because a certain female would pursue him, and he knows that the urge is difficult to control, right, naturally, not for him in particular, but as a man or as men, yeah. you know, he put up the guardrail by telling his wife, he said, listen, you see when Sister X comes to speak with me, you just make sure that you are present or you find this. Once she approaches me, uh, walks up to me, you find yourself right by me, <laughs> right? Or, you know, because the woman has been coming on to him. Right. Uh, so, um, yeah. Now, the thing I, I'd like to say um, is that the reason it's extremely difficult to control is because it's, it's natural. Right. As long as you are a healthy human being within a certain age uh, and in, in good physical condition, you will tend to find that it could be overwhelming right? The urge could be overwhelming. Um, and because you have this overwhelming urge, what ends up happening, even in marriage, right? And I, I hate to be the lone ranger, the only married man on here, uh, but it's circumstantial. Uh, therefore, I will endeavor to be as candid as I can because there aren't other persons making contributions who are married. The thing I'd like to say is that with this overwhelming urge, you will find that because it is so overwhelming, there are times when it could be overwhelming even for the wife, right? Um, and married women, you know, when you have the women on the program, <laughs> as long as they're, they're honest enough, will tell you that sometimes it is it's difficult for them to keep up with the sexual appetite uh, and urges of the husband. I've heard a lot of women say Yeah, and it, is for, and it is for purely biological um, reason, reasons, right? That um, because of the nature of the sex act itself, um, women women might tend to suffer women might tend to um, suffer um, the pure biological effects of sexual activity 
they might suffer from bruising or soreness, you know, which is basically from fatigue, really. And um, the man does not suffer those things generally, right? And so what ends up happening is, is this really a terrible combination of the man's extremely high urge and the fact that the woman might not always be able to keep up with this demand, not because she doesn't want to, not because she doesn't want to, but because naturally she can't, right? Because she'll get bruised and sore and whatever. But the man wants this thing and the man feels urged to do this thing. And the woman says, nah, I can't keep up with that, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, and basically it's the frequency with which the man feels urged to have sex that the woman can't handle because bi uh, biologically um, she can't keep up with it. So that is what makes it difficult to control because he wants it so strongly and the wife might not be able to deliver uh, at the rate that he demands, but then he has these terrible urges of nature. So it's, it's that thing. Hmm. You know, um, I was, I was, I was looking at the research. Well, a few research on how many times men think about sex per day. And um, before I share those information with you guys, I just want you to be honest with me, with us women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, before you ask that question, right? Um, let let me say very quickly that because the urge is strong. And the, the demand is not always satisfied at the rate that the, the, the man would like. Because, again, nature is such an uncanny thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that whatever we can't get is what we desire most, right? Uh, uh, it, it, and it's that vicious cycle. What you want and you want strongly and you want plenty you, um, can't be supplied at the, at the rate you would like you end up wanting it more, which is why this, this urge is terribly uncontrollable, right? For some. And like, like the panelists said earlier, it's <laughs> only God could assist you to control that sometimes. Anyway, right, so going on to what you were just saying. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. But before I do that, I just want to put up two comments from... Um, oh, I wanted the, the, a few comments here I just want to put up before I go to that question. Um, so Donella, hi, Donella, welcome, my dear. She said... Um, Male carry half a billion sperms, they're seed carriers. Number one purpose to provide seeds. Men are always ready for sex. Men are that, is that true? You guys are always ready for sex? I'm just seeing smiles. <laughs> always. Always. <laughs> always. I mean, it's one, of those, it's one of those embarrassing things that men do not like to honestly uh, uh, open up and talk about, but it's true, right? I mean, when, you're, when those two young gentlemen get married, their wives are going to ask them the same thing that my wife has had to ask before. Is sex the first thing that men think about? Is sex, <laughs> uh, there, do men feel that sex solves all problems? Because uh, who wants a man has a problem? <laughs> That's his go-to thing. Uh, you know, and, and married women, these are things that married women worry about, right? Um, that, and especially early in marriage, if, if men want to be honest about it, married men, that is, uh, and this is where I wish there was another married man. But I mean, when you're just married and you're having the experience of what we call yeah, rabbit sex, I mean, for sure. <laughs> frequently. Frequently and as often as possible, right? When you're having rabbit sex. I mean, a man may find, especially in early sexual life uh, of marriage, that he could make the demand for sex within a 24-hour period between five and eight times in a day, right? Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, a very healthy man, right? Uh, and, uh, and the fact is that most times... Uh, if you have uh, the sexual encounter with a woman about four times in a day, <sighs> she hopes that you don't touch her within the next 24 hours, right? <laughs> After the last experience, right? Uh, but 
the mentality of the man is because I enjoyed myself so much yesterday, I would like to have more today of what I had yesterday. Whereas the woman is, is basically saying, hey, 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 uh, you got to hold on because I have to heal, right? I have to recover, right? Uh, so th that is, is really what it is, right? Uh, the man is always ready, right? If he's allowed, he would go between four and, and six or four to eight times in a day if he's allowed. Whereas for the woman, that is not uh, biologically possible without causing her physical difficulty and discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the man always ready. Hmm. Dylan, I, I just called your name, right? This, this all. I <laughs> so, thank you, Danella, for your point. So, Pastor Man, so Pastor Man, so in a roll this afternoon, man. He said men can have sex and not be interested. In, well, this I, I wanna I, I, I will keep this comment here because there's a direct question. I really want you guys to make women understand, help women to understand um that aspect. But this other one, he said the average woman goes through a cycle where well, we all know that uh, she will not always be in the mood. Yeah, we have some extremely crazy moody women, and I am saying that from a woman's perspective because I sometimes I really can't understand some of my female friends, and I'm like, you guys you girls are too moody for me and i'm a woman so i can understand when especially when a man could come out and say yeah you guys are too moody uh but a man's built up is different and he can be aroused anytime many times it will happen when he's off guard he's always seeing things to arouse him hmm. all right yes men and uh, so going back to the question i was about to ask men um so we established so research have proven that um Research has proven that men ha think about sex about X times a day. I wouldn't um, relay the number at this point in time. What I want you to ask you gentlemen to be honest with us about how many times, put aside the sanctified imagination for now, for those of you who are theology students and who are, you know, um, religious, extremely religious, put that aside right now. We are having straight talk. About how many times do you, Think about sex per day. I think um, what Pastor uh, Manzano said is 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 is, is really true, uh, because um, and I wouldn't put a number to it, because um, you could just be like that right now, and then you 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 go on Facebook and you see something, and. It, it, it's it's like that, and especially when you're at the age when you should be married, and everything is kicking, it, you often think about it a lot, right? And so, um, I think it has to do with your your surroundings and social media and and all of these things. You know, you you could just see a girl in a short pants on social media, and that thought comes to mind, you know. And so, it it is something that. I don't I don't know if you can put a number to it because you wouldn't it wouldn't give an accurate number because it's something that is constantly there. And again, I'm saying as you reach age, all right, that's we're tough. married and all of these things. I understand that so that you're saying that um we can't put a number. But right now, we want an approximation. It will not necessarily be. All right, great. Oh, this is the worst internet ever for the entire time since I'm doing program. But yeah, so what I'm is that even though we don't have an approximate figure, um, you may not be able to say, okay, two times or three times. Can you, with all of these external factor, can you give us women an approximation? If you have to put, we just want a numerical figure, even though it may not be 100% accurate. <laughs> what I will say, <laughs> for the times that we are sleeping, we're not thinking about it. But once we're awake, we're thinking about it. <laughs> so that right. that is basically all right. for all of the times that we're awake 
How many hours a day? <laughs> We're just thinking about it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Before I move to Paul, I want to hear Dylan. Dylan, let me hear you. Well, as you were saying, you know, you can't put a number to it. But I'm not sure if, um, if the thought is actually, you know, a thought about sex as in the action. Or is it just, um, you know, a sexual urge rather than an actually action thought about sex? So I'm saying there are many triggers as a man. So, and it's easily triggered for a man. So I'm saying that your sexual urge throughout the day will get triggered many times. But um, to be honest, as in the action, the actual action, um, I'm not sure if that thought actually comes into your mind as much as the urge comes into your mind. So it's more wanting to do it, <laughs> the action of the thought of wanting to do it rather than the act, thought of actually thinking about doing it. I'm not trying sure to get a gist of it. <laughs> and again, you said you can't really um, put, would you agree with Dexter to say um, as you, um, as long as you're awake, you think about it? Well, I wouldn't say as long as you're awake because I would say um, it has to have a trigger. There has to be some trigger, you know, because if you are a place where there's absolutely no trigger and your mind is, you know, on something else, you're focusing on other things and there's no trigger, then you will have no thought of it. But because it's easily triggered, it's very sensitively easily triggered, then in a day, certainly something will trigger it, especially in this mm. 20th century. All right. Um, pass the man's I want to talk. I want to, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take Paul at this time. Let me hear what Paul has to say about this. And I like the fact that you guys are being real and honest. <laughs> well, I would like to see that the reason we don't put a number is because we don't want to scare anybody. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, then. Um, it's, it's, it's infinitive. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but we must remember also that any attempt at statistics uh, um, or, or any statistical uh, um, assessment on such a question is really uh, unreliable because it would vary from person to person, uh, et cetera, right? It, it, it has too many variables uh, for us to um, attempt such a thing. Uh, and like, like, um, like Delon said, there must be a trigger, but the thing I'd like to say is that the triggers are innumerable because Let's face it, um, depending on the environment you're in, triggers would abound, right? Uh, and, and, and a trigger doesn't only uh, come on social media or um, on somebody you see pass by. Um, you could be reading something that makes you think about it, right? Uh, because, you know, these... These things are all around, so it's it's kind of hard to see. But um, the um, what I I will say is that we always say that um, an idle mind is the devil's playground. So if you use that as 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 a mantra, mm -hmm. um, uh, unlike um, what you know, the only time we're not thinking about it is is when we're sleeping. Uh, what I'd like to say is that as long as your mind is preoccupied and you're doing something else, it minimizes the amount of time that, that you would be thinking about it. Now, the, um, the way I uh, find myself avoiding that uh, um, in a, inadvertently, I don't do this to avoid it, but inadvertently because... As a teacher, I find myself always interested in reading and learning and in an avaricious way. Like, I'm never satisfied. Uh, I'm always reading. Uh, and because of that, 
my mind is elsewhere. So I will tend not to uh, think about it as often as the other person would, which would make the statistics that they publish quite unreliable. Because when I'm, when I'm in an unproductive space is when I'd have time to think about all the unproductive things. Not that sex is not productive, but <laughs> it is productive. But uh, the idea is that once, once I am preoccupied, then the amount of times I'm thinking about sex would, would, would definitely um, be significantly reduced, which is why I said it's kind of hard to tell. Because yeah. once I'm, I'm busy and reading, I don't have time for that. Hmm. All right. And, um, well, of course, the research would have said that um, men think about sex every seven seconds, <clears throat> which accounts to approximately, they were just trying to, while they don't have, like, okay, they haven't been able to, um, because just like all three of you, if I was trying to do a research here, all three of you tell, told me that you can put a numerical value to it, right? Mm -hmm. But based on, based on different factors they took into consideration, they realized it's about 7,000 something, almost 8,000 times per day a man thinks about sex. But again, as, as Paul rightly said, based on, if you occupy your mind, it will help to decrease the situation. But um, that is what, that's a, a, a numerical value to have attached to it. But they just wanted to emphasize the point that how often men uh, think about sex. And uh, then we have um, so Pastor Pastor put a comment here again when he said that um, sex for women is more of a psychological and emotional fulfillment, but sex for man has a biological element. When his sperm bank is full, the urge gets stronger. That is why uh, they get nocturnal emissions, which is where dreams men feel for sex even while. Sleeping, Dexter. Where's your face? I, I need to see Dexter's face with his final comment I, here. That men I, feel I, for I, sex by while. Let me hear even you. Even while sleeping, you said the same pass who said he's gonna um you need deliverance. This is the point deliverance. he's making to you. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I I fully agree with him. Of course. Um, because um, whatever is in your subconscious at that time, that's what you dream about, right? And so um, he's, he's absolutely correct. But um, in order to begin the process of my deliverance, I'll try to read something. <laughs> <laughs> or next up. <laughs> and, um... or, mm -hmm. or practice plenty music. When I'm sitting at the piano, trying to make my fingers do what my eyes and brain are telling them what to do, I experience so much frustration. Uh, and, uh, and of course, having to do it over and over and over till you get it right, that, that, that will, that will uh, preoccupy your mind enough. <laughs> yeah, but I believe, I believe Pastor Manzano and, um, and Paul can, can, can really control theirs now. They're married. They're not in need. They are not in but, need. But I There's explained some form earlier. Of fulfillment that has to take place with me. No, but I explained earlier <laughs> that married men suffer too simply because yeah. when the wife has other things competing for her time, that the man gets shunted to the side too. So don't, don't, be, don't be so sure. But that, that is less. after. But you also mentioned uh -huh. that the beginning, the beginning but you also mentioned that at the beginning of that marriage, there's a lot mm -hmm. of it, right? And so you're barely full, <laughs> so you could do it out a two day or a three day. That's true. That's true. But the thing I would like to say is, thank God uh, for Pastor Manzano. Uh, he is a man that I love and admire, and I have never met a pastor more honest and more real. And, you know, he's, he's worth his weight in gold. He's as good as they come, right? I mean, for me, he is the, the, the greatest pastor I've ever met, right? Um, mm. And I'm, I'm saying that publicly for the record. Um, 
if ever I have a, a, a challenge in life, he's the man I would choose to speak with. Lovely, lovely. Pastor Manzana, yeah, but, kudos uh, for you to be on the program. I have to publicly yeah, but, say that. We'll see him soon. Yeah, but, but I was going to say to, um, to my young brother, um, uh, that I was going to say, hug ask him more, make him out so long. She can say, pick me or come, right? <laughs> Yet, no, I, when you see you become married, you are going to understand that we live in such a beautiful but imperfect world that mm -hmm. there is no ideal. And every, like how people say, at every level, there's another devil, right? Um, you're going to find other things challenging within marriage and without in the same topic and arena of sex that become the new ta challenge and new difficulty. And no matter what you say about, you know, oh, well, once you're married, this, that, that, and the other, you, you'll, well, once you, you get to, uh, when uh, you, you get to be married, you'll understand that those challenges uh, still exist, right? For various reasons. Right, uh, and you see, especially since COVID, <laughs> and children home twenty four seven, so that both parents can't be missing for more than a few minutes. They come looking for their parents, right? Um, and if you're like me, and you have one who is still being breastfed, you got double indemnity, because the ones who are still single digit age will come looking for you if if you're missing for more than a few minutes. That's one. And if you, so, so during the day you're dead because they're up, right? <laughs> and if you got a young one who is still on his mother's breast, you would, uh, you would know that if she gets off the bed during the night telling herself, or oh, wants to turn her asleep, the course, the course is clear, right? Um, you will soon get, come to learn that the one who is breastfeeding from its mother sleeps with you. And the minute the mother gets off the bed for more than a few minutes, that child wakes up and starts crying and calling. So don't bother with the idea that, that, that once you're married, you're safe, <laughs> right? So I hope that you would A, keep in touch, and I would hear from you about your suffering during marriage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Paul, oh, 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 Dexter, enjoy the drill, boy. Enjoy it, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's why I'm going to take a, a lovely year before deciding to make children. Right. You hit the nail on the head, right? And the reason I, I say it'd be good to be in touch, because as a married person, I am very generous and uh, with, with young people about being absolutely truthful about what obtains, right? I, I don't lie about it, especially to Christian young people. Because I know that even though people getting married go through um, uh, um, counseling, unlike Pastor Mansano, there are many, many pastors uh, that tend to keep a closed door on certain topics, or they generally just uh, scratch the surface and move on because it would be uncomfortable for them to get into great detail because they wouldn't be as generous about sharing about themselves. But the thing I, you've hit the nail on the head. The thing to do is to ensure that when you get married, you do not have children right away. Because having a child, uh, once you have a child, that child takes center stage in, in your lives, in both your lives, sometimes more so for the woman than the man, which causes another problem as well, right? Because women are all about their children. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the fact is that once a child is born, that child becomes center stage, right? That child takes center stage, and uh, your relationship one to another is um, the dynamics of that relationship uh, becomes altered in a way that cannot be changed, okay? Therefore, uh, make sure that your honeymoon lasts as long as it can, right? Like I took three years to have the first child, right? So the, the, I didn't take one year. I had two good years and I will still count the third because one of the glories of your wife being pregnant is that there's no period. So no, no stoplight for you. <laughs> right, true. 
And then, of course, because of the fact that one of the by- byproducts of pregnancy is that uh, because the woman's body is hard at work, the body temperature goes up. So she's constantly hot, which means that very often less and less clothes becomes comfortable and convenient, which is a, 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 an exciting prospect for you <laughs> because more and more she's sleeping with less, less, less and less clothes or no clothes. So great. And she got no period to rescue her. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right, Paul, I, I love your submissions. So what we're going to do, we I'm going to put some of the comments on the screen. I don't think I'm going to ask any more questions. I have another appointment coming up soon. And um, so what we're going to do, I'm just going to put these comments up. And then we're going to compare to Pastor Manzano. Please book one time. I'm publicly saying this. Um, these gentlemen, as long as they're available, they'll be back with us next week. And of course, I need you to be here next week too. Same time, 2 o'clock. We're going to continue part 2 to this discussion. We still have a lot of questions to explore. And I, I'm quite certain that after today's program, women will be sending more questions to me. Even if we have to get a part three of this question of this session, Paul, I don't mind. When we finish talking, no, none of the young ladies should say they're now short of answers because they don't understand certain dynamics of our men. So we well, make sure I, that we set the platform fully. Well, I hope you know my, my nickname, eh? my other name. Go be my, my name is my name is John Blunt. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, what you're gonna have the discussion? Fine, right? As long as people are prepared for me to be absolutely honest, I got no problem. My name is John Blunt. <laughs> what I love that that is what we want persons to be straight, not to be sugarcoating anything on this for, forum because our young people need to learn too and so i want to put up Trust these me. comments they need to know Start. yeah they need to know we need to know for me i am mm. every time I have these dialogues i'm learning a whole lot because because i i love asking questions and when i get to know answers from you guys i i know what to do you know well you have to well, be let smart me say very, let me mm. say very quickly mm-hmm. i also learned from older people in my family who were generous I will tell you yeah. about a cousin of mine who at the time was married for over 50 years, if it's not 53 years, 56 years, right? And her husband is a pastor. Eh? So she's the wife of a minister. Uh, when I was getting married, she called me aside, right? She's a, my grandfather's cousin, uh, right? So it's three, three generations down and she called me aside. She said, Paul, Come, I need to talk to you. <laughs> so I went, I said, yes, Cousin Olive. She said, I've been married to my husband for over 50 years. And don't get me wrong. Wow. I absolutely love my husband. But I must tell you this because you're my cousin. She said, um, one, uh, you're still hearing me, right? Yes, I'm hearing you. Right, uh-huh. So, yeah, phone call was, was just disturbing. Uh, so, yeah, she said to me, I've been married to my husband for more than uh, 50 years, and I love my husband, don't get me wrong. She said, but you're my relative, and because you're my relative, I've got to talk to you, and I've got to let you know. Just so- sometimes, just sometimes, you've got to know that a woman could do without having a man around. <laughs> I was like, what? The Ooh. pastor's wife? Yeah, yeah, she says, yeah, she says a woman could sometimes do without having a man around. And being married, I now understand what she was saying, right? The woman could do without having the man around for several reasons. Sometimes she doesn't feel like cooking. Forget the sex for a while. Sometimes she doesn't feel like cooking, and it's not because she's lazy, but because having to deal with the menu for three meals a day uh, for all them years, it, the challenge yeah. is not cooking. It's sometimes deciding what to cook. What okay? to cook. What to cook. So that's one. Two, sometimes she has the right to be lazy and not want to cook. Right? And you must understand that. And if you always get your meals up to date and one day she decides she ain't feel like it, 
That's nothing to quarrel about. This is what she talks about, the woman feeling like she could do without having a man around. Yeah. You don't necessarily need to be physically absent, but you must realize that you don't always have to be making demands on the woman's time, energy, and everything else, right? Absolutely. So the, the, the food is one. If she feels like she doesn't feel like cleaning this day because she always has the house pick and span, it's her right sometimes to put up her foot and not have to do it, right? And, and the sex thing is a, is a foregone thing because we talked about it. There are times when she feels like she needs you to leave her alone, right? So sometimes if, make yourself scarce in more ways than one. <laughs> I love that contribution. I love it. I hope Delon and Dex, they're listening. The D's, they're listening to us today. And um, all right, so I'm just going to put up this, um, this, these comments here. Desnit, I promise you, I'm going to promote your stuff. I, I just want to say this. I'm not, I didn't get a video to download, but <clears throat> these young people would have started a book, um, a, writing a magazine. And um, the subscription is just 400 Guyana dollars a month. And you will receive a soft copy of the magazine. Um, I didn't get the, the video to download, so I can't show you the promo right now, but I really and truly want you to support them. And on Friday, by God's grace, I'll program time, and I will keep doing it for next week. I'm going to break every session in next week, and we're going to promote it. It's just a minute and something so that you can support them in this particular um, venture. So um, <clears throat> with that in mind, Pastor Manzano would have said this. Um, Sex for a woman is more of a psychological, emotional fulfillment, but sex for a man has a biological element. When his form bank is full, he gets, oh, I think we dealt with this one already. Um, Donella would have said, okay, in contrast to the woman, a woman number one need isn't sex. She likes it, she enjoys it. Her number one need is affection. So if you give her affection, you will get your needs met. Dexter, sex. So I think the you should start having a Dylan have a book and start writing down these tips or at least before you're ready, you can check back on the program. The program is saved on Facebook, YouTube. So you guys can have some continuous tip where you hear people like Paul talking and Pastor Manzano giving counsel. And next week by God, so we have more married men on the program to give you single men some very pertinent counsels uh, this afternoon. What do you have to say in defense, Dex? I see you've got it from your seat. So I, I just want to say though, I, I am not running down anything, you know. I am just here saying the truth, the whole yes. truth, and nothing but the truth. I right? agree with you. If I think about it, I'm a man. I should think about it. God of made course. it. And if so I I'm not going to be like some of the pastors or some of the ministers that Paul talk about that does not want to, to talk about it or scratch the surface. I, if I think about it, it's within me, right? And so... Yeah. I will take Ms. DeMatis' um, point and I will show affection so I can get my desires. <laughs> Amen. And you know, Dex, so when I think about it, imagine, I always say one thing. Sex, when it comes to, you know, argument and, you know, somebody may be wondering why we, we actually stuck on sex because just now, Paul, because we recognize that women, women, most times the, the clash in marriages is this sex thing. Because when you talk to women, you will always hear them asking questions about that and they can't understand this. I will talk to men. Men too cannot comprehend it. I will have a problem if I marry my husband and thinking about sex. Like, really, bro? I mean, if, even if it's 3% of your your marriage, sex is, is one thing that breaks your marriage and it's so you still need it where it's only 3%. If it's, even if it's 1%, you still need it. So at the end of the day, it must be there. Yes, Paul? No, I was going to uh, make... Uh, uh, give the tip that affection for a woman, especially in marriage, men need to learn. And so I'm telling these young guys, affection for the woman uh, can be showed can be shown in several ways. Affection doesn't always mean being up in the woman's face, telling her sweet nothings, right? Mm -hmm. Affection don't mean they're uh, caressing her cheek, kissing her, telling her how much you love her telling her how much you appreciate her and things. 
for a woman, especially as you get further and further into marriage, you'll get to realize that a wo- you can show affection for your wife in such an indirect and profound way that she'll love you for it and she might end up coming and, and offering it and serving it up just because you, you showed affection in, in an unusual way. And by that I mean affection for a woman might mean clearing the sink full of dishes oh, while yeah. she's out uh, at the supermarket. As she comes and she meets the sink clean, she feel nice, mm-hmm. right? She feel good. And yeah, this man did something helpful, so I don't have to do it. You ain't got to ask. She's gonna, she's gonna, she's gonna swing it up, right? Just because you know you did something, uh, or you know you, you swept the house, or you you packed up the clothes that the children left scattered on the bedroom floor in the laundry basket, right? And and you brush out and you, you or you cooked, right? So affection oh, yeah. isn't always physical and giving personal attention, but doing something that demonstrates that you care, right? So um, some men might wonder why she came through the door. I kissed her. I took her bag from her and I tried stroking her cheek and, and hugging her, but she seems reluctant. Why? Because she left you home and she passed by the kitchen after the kiss. And see, mm-hmm. wait, this man I washed the wheels? And now you're looking for sex? Nah. But you're thinking, but I showed her affection. I'm being warm. I greeted her when she came through the door, right? Or, like, and there are other ways, right? Like I said, I on the clothes one Sunday night so that she ain't got to do it, you know? Exactly. And yeah, those things make a big, big, big difference. And it got nothing to do with you being touchy feely, smoochy, smoochy, and lovey dovey. That's right. <clears throat> That's right, gentlemen who are listening, whether you whether you are on the panel or not, very profound contribution, Paul. And I endorse that 101%. My C I'll sign that, seal it, and deliver it to the gentlemen this afternoon. Those who are listening uh, to us today. No, no, don't give the husband too rough a time when you get married because of all these things <laughs> we teach him here. Yeah? No, 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 no. He because be, because the, oh, it means a lot to be, me. It means a because, lot. Because there are some husbands who might not like, they mightn't do the dishes uh, not because they don't care, but they just don't like washing wheels. I or they might iron the clothes because yeah, that's not their thing. Right? Yeah. Because the other, the, the other thing with women, and I hate to do this, uh, but the other thing with women is that they get fixated on the process of marriage, you see. When the man arrives at the church, he walks up the aisle. Mm-hmm. And he's, then he stands before the altar and makes his vows. Mm-hmm. And when he's done, the congregation sings a hymn. And women think that that is the objective of marriage. Aisle, altar, hymn. <laughs> She thinks that she's got to remake the man into what she wants. And that also causes problems. You see, I'll alter him. <laughs> that sequence is a problem. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's a valid point. And I must say, yeah, sometimes we women we um we erred in that in that there. And and that's why for me communication is so um important on the onset of things. Because uh for me, I I usually say. Paul, you're going to buy, okay, um, right now I need a new phone. This phone that I have is not the best, right? But you, my husband, you realize that, hey, let me just buy a phone for my wife. Yes, you buy a phone for me, yes, but then what happens? It is not, like, you you don't do anything else at home, like, absolutely nothing. For me, this phone has no value because for me, how, how you will show me love is through acts of service. That's how I will receive or perceive that you really love. So for me, I prefer stay with my little cheap phone, manage with it once it's once you can still contact me and help me do things around. Let's work together in order to make our family the best that it can be. That's my thing, right? So no, the, the other thing is it's not just communication. Because you could communicate all you want if you're talking to a brick wall. Because like I said, mm-hmm. once a person has been made and conditioned the way they are. Forget communication. 
their ways are set. That's how they are. That's how they think. That's how they operate. What is more important is um, vetting the candidate and deciding to mitigate on the things that they possess that you can live with and the things that they possess that you cannot live with. And when you mitigate and decide where you can take and where you can take, then you decide, okay, I'm going in to a marriage because you don't go into the marriage and then try to change the person while you're in the marriage or change the things you saw all along that you disliked and hope that when you get into marriage, you will change them. No, 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 no. Those things have got to be addressed before you get in because no amount of communication is going to alter a person's disposition. Hmm. Valid. I agree. Yeah, I take that one. All right, so we have to wrap up now. Um, thank you very much, Dylan, Dexter, and Paul. And I just want to end with Pastor Manzana's final comment. Sometimes a woman feels for... In I know this one here could go... We could have a long discourse on this one too, but we just have to wrap up. Sometimes a woman feels for intimacy or romance and will not want sex. And most men can't understand that. Oh my gosh. Yes, indeed. A lot of men can't understand that. So we're going to wrap up with that one. And uh, once again, audience... Sorry, I couldn't acknowledge all of you by your names today, but thank you all for um for tuning in. I uh, I know um Genevieve would have made a comment too <laughs> about the clothes. I will put this one up too, not because you see a woman and especially one dress immodestly, you start thinking about sex. She is not a sex object. Well, of of course, if you were um Genevieve earlier, if you were here, I mean it, it's not so easy as we will put it here. As you have put it there for the men, it's not that easy, but we're going to continue this discourse next week. And um, all of these gentlemen, they may be back. If not, we will have some added person to, to, to our platform next week. So we just want to, but, um, Brother Delon, I will usually ask you whenever you sit on the panel to wrap, to close us in prayer um, as we close this afternoon. All right, wonderful. Let us pray. Great God who art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the discussion that we had today. We thank you, Lord, for the many wise counsel that we received. We thank you, Lord, for all of our participants, all of our the comments that came in from the audience. Dear Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this fruitful discussion. Father, we understood a lot today when it comes to men and women and sexuality and thoughts and everything, dear Father. But in all of this, dear Father, we just pray, dear Lord, that you may keep us ever true and ever faithful to you. We pray, dear Lord, that as young men, we may be grow up to be spiritual, wise, humble, loving husbands, dear Heavenly Father. I pray, dear Lord, that the women may be understanding, dear Father, of certain things that, you know, women may find difficult to explain. Help them, dear Lord, to be able to understand us, dear God. Help us have, you know, successful relationships, successful marriages, dear Father. We thank you for your blessings upon this program, and we ask that you may continue to bless this program. And you need to help it to be a light, a beacon, and a strength to someone, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thanks again, Dylan. Thanks, um, Paul and Dexter. I'm going to see the audience again on Friday at 2 p.m. as we look at another issue. Remember, this continues next Wednesday. Um, be blessed and have an awesome Wednesday evening. God's blessings. Thank you very much. Have a good day.